I think it's okay if we begin now. Oh. It's five mm -hmm. five or five. Sure. Uh okay. Hi everyone, welcome to this guest lecture for week 10 for the basic course in ornithology. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are honored to have Dr. Mansi with us today to give us a guest lecture on microecology, a case study by her. So but we'll start with the introduction first. Uh, Dr. Mansi was a post is currently a postdoc fellow at the University of Leeds, UK. And she was also a former PhD student at ISA Pune under Dr. Ramana Atreya. Her research expertise spans across multiple domains, such as community ecology, macroecology, global change ecology, trof insects, trophic interactions, biodiversity conservation, and policy making. For her research work, she is particularly interested in extending the advances of trait and phylogeny based analysis in order to understand the spatial temporal patterns in diversity and assembly of ecological communities especially along the environmental gradient. At the University of Leeds, she is involved in a multi-collaborative project, which is known as the Drivers and Repercussions of UK Insect Decline, so no, also known as DRUID. All yours. Thank Dr. you. Thank yeah. you for joining us today. No problem. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Can everyone hear me? I will uh, assume that's a yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right, so this is going to be a case study on macroecology. Uh, I'm assuming that the students here today, the, uh, the listeners who have tuned in have some background uh, on community ecology and macroecology in general. So the work that I'm presenting today was actually a part of my PhD work, which was done at ISER Pune. Uh, start. Right, can people see this now? Okay, so this work was done as part of my PhD work, which was done at ISER Pune from around 2011 to 2017. And this, this work was, uh, the work that I'm presenting today is part of a much larger project, so to say, that we did on moths and birds. So it was a comparative study between an ectothermic group of organisms and an endothermic group of organisms. And we are trying to understand how these two very distinct groups of organisms change with elevation. So to study change with elevation, we, we use communities as our unit of study. So we don't study individual species or individual groups, but we study a community of moths and a community of birds, right? So the work that I'm presenting today specifically is about community assembly of birds. So I will start with a brief overview of what I mean by community and community assembly. How can we study community assembly in nature? Uh, and why should we care about it? Right. So we'll start with what do I mean by community and community assembly? So community here, of course, refers to ecological community. We are talking about the community of living organisms. And the word community is a little subjective when it comes to ecology. I can define a community as a group of moths or a group of birds, or I can define it as a group of just hawk moths, which is a, just one family of moths, or a community of just parrots, which are specific group of birds. I can also define community to be a community of multiple groups, right? A community which is nested at, let's say, a specific elevation will be community of moths, birds, ants, plants, everything that live together. So here for the purposes of my thesis and my research in general, I like to define communities of specific groups. So communities of moths and communities of birds. And today is all about birds. So I will just be talking about communities of birds. Now, what are community assembly processes and what do I mean by community assembly? So in plain English assembly, the word refers to the, the a collection of similar objects which have been put together for a specific purpose. Why have I assembled these 
tools here or why have i assembled this table here using all these similar looking wooden parts right so in ecology community assembly refers to all these processes which have put a community together right so all processes which have put this specific collection or species of birds together in this location now without any background just using intuition uh, we can sort of come up with an exhaustive list of what these community assembly processes should be like right why are these birds found in south india and not in north india why are these birds found in eastern himalayas for instance and not in goa right so that's we are talking about communities here and we are talking about the processes which have put these communities in their place so is it the environment of that location the birds in south india prefer the abiotic conditions of south india is it the presence or absence of a superior competitor which is why these species are not found here or is it just a random chance dispersal event for instance there was a wildlife trade involving certain species of birds which displaced them from their original location to this new location and now this bird has colonized this new area so these are all assembly processes you know it can be the abiotic conditions or the environment it can be biotic conditions or a competitor or a symbiote and it can be a random event like a chance dispersal event so these are all what are collectively known as community assembly processes and there is a whole field within macroecology or community ecology which concerns itself with studying these community assembly processes because if you know the process which has put a collection of species in a particular place then you know why the species diversity or these collection of species are changing through space and time and which is the prerequisite to understanding how species will react to changing environment because with space and time the thing that actually changes is really the environment right so to understand how species change with climate change or any other kind of change you have to understand how these assembly processes function or change now there are two most commonly used community assembly processes not most commonly used most well studied i should say and also which have been found to be most important when it comes to studying the assembly of ecological communities these are known as environmental filtering and interspecific competition really big fancy scary sounding words but really they are quite simple if you stay with me i have sort of understood that it is it becomes easier to understand these processes with the help of a, a common underlying schematic which i will stick to throughout this talk right so if you look at the schematic here to your uh, right assume that this is a hypothetical mountain system and along this mountain at different elevations there are different communities of birds which are living right again this should make sense alpine birds will be different than low elevation birds alpine community of plants will be different than low elevation plants right so you have different communities living at different elevations along this mountain now if i pool all these species living across different elevations together then what i get is known as a regional species pool right which is shown in the outermost panel here i i hope you can see my cursor so this outermost panel refers to your regional species pool and it's a term very commonly used in community ecology specifically in meta uh, community and meta population but so when you pool all the available species it's known as the regional species pool and when you have the specific collection of species at different elevations that's your local communities right so when i want to study community assembly of birds let's say along an east himalayan mountain i will just go and sample the birds or count the birds at different elevations on that mountain right and all the birds that i count at a specific elevation let's say between 200 and 300 meters above sea level that's my low elevation local community and all the birds that i found between 2000 and 2500 meters that's my high elevation community so now the process that i am trying to understand is given the total species richness of that region 
what are the factors that have led to the formation of these distinct local communities at different elevations right so that's my community assembly process now environmental filtering says that given a regional species pool certain species will be able to survive or adapt to the environment of a given elevation right so your birds which are adapted to higher elevations will be filtered at high elevations those which are adapted to low elevations will be filtered at low elevation which is why it's called a filtering right it's like a sieve a, a metaphorical sieve which has filtered out the species which cannot survive at that elevation so only the species which can survive are present now because all these species if they have to survive in similar environment then they should all possess very similar traits right so they should possess similar body sizes which can survive in higher elevation harsh conditions or similar beak sizes to utilize the resources at that elevation right which means that because they are all now very similar they will also compete more strongly with each other for those available set of resources right so then your next filter or next assembly process comes in the picture which reduces this competition by removing the very similar species right so it creates gaps in your species pool so your environmental filtering has selected for very similar species that can survive in the environment and interspecific competition has removed few of these to minimize the competition and create uh more distances between these species so your net result or your local community is now a trade off between how similar and dissimilar these species can be right so this is how you study the 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 relationship between a local community and a regional species pool so given all the birds found in india if you are to if you are to understand how these different communities in different pockets of india are formed you study the relationship between those birds and their uh, uh, environment as well as the relationship between those different birds together that is the competition between them now this is all nice and good as a framework as a conceptual framework but how do i actually go around studying this in nature right how do i know whether a species is adapted to that environment or whether a species is competing with this other species how can i actually quantify some of these things in nature and this is where a framework known as multifaceted biodiversity comes in the picture which is actually a very important topic in community ecology and macroecology in general i'm not sure if this is covered i will just assume that uh, the listeners here have little to no background on this subject so when we quantify biodiversity when i use the term biodiversity the first thing that comes to our mind is probably species diversity or species richness the biodiversity of this region is higher than the biodiversity of that region which means i'm probably talking about there are more species here than the other region right but that can actually be very sometimes misleading and sometimes not entirely uh, uh, complete information that i'm giving you for instance what if let's take two communities community a and b and both have 10 species now of course everyone would be tempted to say that they are equally diverse the biodiversity of community a is equal to biodiversity of community b now what if i tell you that the 10 species in community a are actually all from the same genus whereas the 10 species in community b are actually from 10 different genera or 10 distinct genera right they still have the same 10 species but now the phylogenetic diversity or the diversity of lineages present in the two communities is very different right so one has a much higher phylogenetic diversity now if we take the example of let's say birds these 10 species are 10 birds so the species in community a have all very similar beak sizes they are all different kinds of warblers they have very similar beak sizes but the 10 species in community b have very distinct beak sizes one is a warbler one is a pigeon one is a hornbill one is a magpie right very distinct beak sizes so now i know that species 
community A and community B have very distinct phylogenetic diversity. They have very distinct species diversity. Now, when I have actually quantified a trait, which is the beak size, I know that they have very different functions that they are performing, right? Because community A is eating the same kinds of probably insects or same kinds of seeds because they all have very similar beak sizes. But community B can actually perform a large variety of ecosystem functions. It can have insects, it can have insects, it can even prey on other smaller uh, uh, invertebrates, uh, different kinds of nectar or maybe grain sizes or seeds. So there are there's a vast variety of functions that they are performing. And I got this extra information because I did not just stop at the species diversity. I actually measured their traits also, right? So these three facets of biodiversity are known as species diversity or taxonomic diversity, phylogenetic diversity, and functional diversity. And they they give you very different information about a community. So to understand this better, let's just consider these two communities here. Community A and B, they both have 20 species. Community A, as you can see, mostly comprises of one kind of birds. They're all mostly parakeets of different kinds or parrots of different kinds. Here we have community B, which has very distinct kinds of birds, right? So even though the species diversity is the same in both. We can see that they are very different when it comes to their phylogenetic diversity and when it comes to their trait diversity, right? And that trait can be anything. It can be body size. It can be beak size. It can just be the color of the plumage, right? I have not defined which trait right now. And that's important, but we can come to that later. But whatever trait you think of in mind, it can be wing length. It can be the leg uh, tarsus length you will see that they will be very distinct. This will generally be more constrained. It will have a smaller variety of trait, whereas here you will find a higher diversity of traits. So now if I have to see uh, graphically what phylogenetic diversity looks like. So this is a phylogenetic tree of birds. Phylogenetic tree is basically just the relationship between different species, which has been inferred using genetic uh, data or DNA sequences. So here, phylogenetic diversity is quantified as the sum of branch lengths connecting the species. So if I'm looking at just parrots, uh, which will somewhere be here, right? So if I'm looking at just different kinds of parrots, they will have a very small branch length, right? So let's assume there are three parrots here. So the sum of branch lengths will be very small. But if I'm looking at a large number of species, then the sum of branch lengths will automatically become a higher number. So in our previous example, we have community A and B, and you can see that depending on the diversity metric that you use, functional, phylogenetic, or taxonomic, the values change, right? And not just the values change, the, the difference between the two community also changes. They are identical when it comes to taxonomic diversity, but they, their difference sort of increases when you change the metric used for comparison. So these three metrics of diversity or these three facets of diversity can actually help us to understand the community assembly processes that we were talking about, your environmental filtering and interspecific competition. And how can we do that? So I would just go back to my previous schematic. So now let's say instead of the regional species pool, I have a regional trait pool, right? So instead of now looking at birds at different elevations, I've looked at beak sizes at different elevations. Why is this important? Because I can quantify beak size. I can actually measure beak size, right? So that is important here. So now I have a total beak size range and I have a local communities range of beak size. Now, I know that if environmental filtering is a very strong process here, then these beak sizes will actually be very uh, similar to each other, right? They can all be the same beak size or they will actually have a very small range. They will not be a very diverse kind of beak sizes. But if interspecific competition is dominant or is very strong, then that diversity will actually be larger. They will actually be more distinct from each other, right? So this automatically tells me that depending on the 
on the diversity of beak sizes. I can actually inform whether environmental filtering is strong or interspecific competition is strong. So, uh, so that's exactly what is written here that environmental filtering will assemble traits of a similar kind because you know for a given elevation you want similar beak sizes whereas competition will actually tend to segregate these beak sizes. So depending on which of these two process is actually dominant, you can actually see that difference in the distribution of beak sizes at a given elevation. So this is how functional diversity can actually help to inform which community assembly process is actually more relevant or more important in your local community or in a specific local community. There's a catch here, of course. Again, let's stick to beak sizes. We have assumed that the beak size is actually involved in environmental filtering as well as interspecific competition, which means that we assume that when the, when the environment selects for that trait, a specific trait, it actually selects a specific kind of beak size. And that beak size between uh, closely related species or co-occurring species is also involved in competition. That may actually not be true. We know that beak size is involved in competition because it determines what kind of resources you compete for, but whether actually specific abiotic environment also selects for beak sizes, we don't know that. We know that probably temperature selects for a specific body size. We know that air density may select for a specific wing size. But does environment actually select for specific beak sizes? We don't know that, right? So that's a sort of a problem. If you have just one trait and you're assuming it will be equally involved in both community assembly processes, that may not be true. Second, your traits are often very correlated, right? Because a hornbill is larger body size, it also has larger beak sizes. Whereas your warblers have smaller body size and smaller beak sizes. So when you look for the effect of environmental filtering, you don't know whether it has actually acted on body size and you're just seeing the effect on beak size, right? So that may be a problem because now your traits are not giving you the correct information that they should. And finally, it is virtually impossible to measure all possible functional traits of species, right? We are talking only about beak sizes, but to actually measure in field beak sizes, body sizes, tarsus length, wing length, and then there are a lot of behavioral traits also. I'm using only morphological traits example, but you can have life history traits such as what, what is the diet of that birds? Are they insectivores or grainivores or nectarivores? What are the different, uh, uh, you know, their nesting tendencies or their flight behavior or their any other kind of habitat uh, affinity. So there are a wide variety of traits and these are all functional traits, which means they actually have an effect on the species position along an elevational gradient. But it may not be possible to measure all these traits together. And this is where the phylogenetic diversity actually can come in the picture. <clears throat> because Genetic sequences are now sort of easily available, readily available for many different kinds of taxa, especially for plants and birds. And you can assume that closely related species will actually compete more strongly, right? And closely related species will actually have similar environmental requirements. So even if you've not been able to measure all functional traits, if you can just establish their relatedness or their phylogenetic relationships, then you can use the same framework. So again, going back to the same schematic, the outermost panel being now your regional phylogenetic pool. So your environment will select for similar or closely related species on a phylogenetic tree and your interspecific competition will minimize the competition by eliminating the sister species pair or the very closely related species, right? So you can have, let's say, 10 genera, which are selected from environmental filtering. And within those 10 genera, your competition will eliminate one, one species from each genera, right? It will not eliminate all species from the same genera because that does not help it. It wants to eliminate the really closely related species. So uh, the ones which are, let's say, congenerics or really closely related. 
so again your local community will be trade off between how closely related and how distinctly related are the species in the local community so now we have a framework we know there is environmental filtering we know there is interspecific competition and we know that we can use functional traits and phylogenetic diversity to study the importance of uh, environmental filtering and interspecific competition and if i just bring all these concepts together in a single schematic then it looks something like this so assume that this topmost phylogenetic tree that you see here is your regional phylogenetic pool right this is all the species which are present across a region across a mountain system i've just ordered the species here on this phylogenetic tree so the closely related species let's say these are three genus so all the closely related species will have similar traits right they these are all parrots these are all hornbills these are all warblers right so they have similar traits within each group now if your environmental filtering is dominant it will select for similar phylogenies and similar traits so in this hypothetical example hypothetical community you will have a community which is all very similar in their trait structure functional structure as well as they are closely related when competitive interactions dominate or interspecific competition dominates you will have divergence which means they will come from actually very distinct uh, uh, groups or clades so that the competition between them is minimized and how do you know whether so these are of course extreme hypothetical examples these are all from the same genus these are from three different genera but in nature in the real empirical data you actually get a mixture of different kinds of things so how do you know whether your community is actually uh, more diverged or converged than expected than you actually expect in nature for that you assemble something known as a random community which means that that you just take random species from your regional pool and then you compare your observed data with that random data and then you comment whether your observed community has a higher convergence or a lower divergence so convergence comes from environmental filtering divergence comes from interspecific competition right so if we can just quickly recap everything that i've said till now i know this was a lot to take in uh first community assembly processes these are processes that help you understand how communities are assembled that is they help you understand how communities change with environment two most commonly type of community assembly processes are environmental filtering and interspecific competition environmental filtering selects for all species which have very similar traits or are very closely related on a phylogenetic tree because they should all be able to survive in the environment of a given location so they all have similar morphologies similar ecologies and are closely related so it results in a functional and phylogenetic convergence or low diversity of functional and phylogenetic diversity interspecific competition on the other hand leads to an opposing pattern that is it tries to limit their similarity limits functional and phylogenetic similarity and causes divergence so you can study the presence or absence or even the uh, relative dominance of one of these processes by studying the functional and phylogenetic structure so if you have environmental filtering dominating then you will have functional and phylogenetic convergence and if you have uh, vice versa right so this is the background okay this is entirely the the background of the case study that i am about to discuss so what i studied during my phd and actually an extension to my phd was how community assembly processes specifically environmental filtering and interspecific competition change with elevation along an east himalayan uh elevational transect and which is why i've used that mountain schematic throughout my um uh examples so this study that i'm talking about it was done in a small region in uh, arunachal pradesh in northeast india uh in a region known as eagle nest wildlife sanctuary so the eagle nest wildlife sanctuary is actually just a tiny about 280 square kilometer region which is found here 
in uh, Western Arunachal Pradesh in this region, right? So on the Southern boundary of this region, you have Assam and then you have Bhutan here, right? The remarkable thing about Eagle Nest and Arunachal and Eastern Himalayas in general is that it actually has a very high diversity of endemic birds. So if you see this global map here, then this bar tells you the number of endemic or range restricted bird species. And this lower panel tells you the total diversity of birds in that region. So it is the it has the highest density of endemic birds anywhere in the world, which means the birds found here are actually not found anywhere else. And it actually ranks very high in terms of the total diversity of species richness also. Right. So this is a very diverse region, which is important because when you're studying something such as interspecific competition, you actually want more number of species because competition is expected to kick in only when there are too many species competing for the same kind of resources. Right. The second important thing about Eagle Nest is that it presents a very large environmental gradient the elevation. So this here in the white boundary, that's the map of the sanctuary where the study was con conducted, Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary. And this orange line is a road which traverses the sanctuary. It's known as the Eagle Nest Road. I know that when you hear the word road, it sounds like, oh, there's a road in the middle of the sanctuary, but this has actually been a it's been a blessing for all the ecologists and scientists working there because this road was actually abandoned long ago. So it is not used for any regular tourism or traffic. It's actually a dirt track, but it is still motorable. And the primary forest occurs in very close proximity to this road. So the road actually does not really create a lot of damage to the ecological uh, system of that place, but instead gives us an opportunity to study the interior parts of that sanctuary very well. And this road actually goes, so here the elevation along that road is around 200 meters above sea level. And then it goes up, it climbs up to this point. And this point, which is the Eagle Nest Pass, is around 2,800 meters in elevation. So it goes from 200 meters to 2,800 meters. And the straight line distance between these two points, or between the lowest and highest elevation, is actually just 20 kilometers. So in just 20 kilometers, your elevations actually change by more than 2,500 meters, right? And elevation, of course, is just a proxy for all these other kinds of environment changing. So with elevation, your vegetation changes, your temperature changes, uh, precipitation changes, uh, wind, uh, air density changes, right? So you have a great variety of environment changing across a very small spatial scale which means that you can actually study the effect of changing environmental filtering because these different environments should select for different kinds of functional structure. And just to give you an idea of how important this system is, the temperature difference between these two lowest and highest elevation points is actually around 20 degrees Celsius. And to see the same kind of temperature difference, you will actually have to travel 2000 kilometers in latitude, right? So you have to actually go from like the bottom of uh, the tip of Southern India to the uh, northernmost point in India. And you see that difference in just 20 kilometers here, right? So this actually presents a very nice ecological laboratory, so to say, to study the effect of both environmental filtering and interspecific competition because of its really high diversity. So the <clears throat> bird transit counts were actually conducted along this Eagle Nest Road by this really remarkable project student who was in the lab at that time, Rohan Pandit, who is here in the center. Rohan is a remarkable bird watcher, uh, very experienced, and uh, he conducted very thorough systematic transit counts at different elevations along the Eagle Nest Road. All right. So between 200 and 2800 meters at every 50 meter elevational resolution. That's almost 48 points, data points. He conducted 12 transits at each of these points and all birds that he spotted visually or heard acoustic uh, signals, he recorded them uh, for uh, characterizing 
the different communities at different elevations, right? So in total, he recorded almost uh, more than 15,000 birds spanning 245 species and 50 families, right? So that's a very uh, robust data set to study how communities change with elevation. So now, as we saw before, to study community assembly processes, we need three kinds of data. We need the species data, which we have, but now I also need the traits and the phylogenetic relationships of these species. So we collected the species data from the field and for the trait data, this was assembled using secondary literature because birds are relatively very well studied group of organisms and a lot of their information is available from previous uh, resources. So I assembled these traits for birds, wing length, tarsus length, body mass. These three traits are can be assumed to be involved in environmental adaptation. We know that specific aspects of elevation, which I'm using as a proxy for environment, select for specific kinds of these morphological traits. So we know that wing length should increase with elevation because larger wings relative to body should help you fly better at higher elevations where air density is lower or wing speeds are more unpredictable and large. Tarsus length, again, changes with the habitat structure because with different kinds of forest uh, canopy density or uh, habitat complexity, your tarsus length changes. And finally, a body mass because birds are endotherms, so it makes it is beneficial for them to be larger bodied at higher elevations so that they can be better at thermoregulation. So we know that these three traits should help in different environmental adaptation and therefore the environment should actually select for these three traits at different elevations. And the remaining five traits can be assumed to be involved in competition. And the literature classifies these as alpha and beta traits. So I've used those terminologies here. But what I want to emphasize is that these three traits should be involved in environment and these five traits, that is your beak size, which we know is involved in competition, the substrate where the birds use for perching, the foraging height at which they obtain their resources from, their primary diet, and the habitat in which they live. These are all involved in competition between uh, co-occurring species. So all these data on eight functional traits was obtained for all those 245 species from literature. And finally, the phylogenetic tree for those 245 species was also obtained from a previous data set. Uh, and uh, right, so this is not important. This is what the phylogenetic tree looks like. And here I've just colored the branch lens using body size so that you can see that actually the birds which are in the same clade I'm using clade as a uh, uh, like a ambiguous term, which means like a group. So you can see that similar colors are retained in the same clade, which means that birds which are closely related also have similar body sizes, right? So we know that they can actually be involved in competition. Right, so now I have, uh, sorry about this slide. Uh, so now we have the functional data, we have phylogenetic data, and we have the species data. But the question to ask now is, okay, I'm studying community assembly of East Himalayan birds, but what about community assembly am I studying? You know, do I have a hypothesis in mind? I can't just up and say that oh, I want to study community assembly processes. I need to have something in mind with respect to what am I actually testing? And this is where something known as a stress dominance hypothesis comes in the picture. So in ecology, there are several of these hypotheses, and I chose this specific one known as stress dominance hypothesis, which concerns itself with how community assembly processes change along elevational or any other environmental gradient. So very relevant for the study that I was uh, interested in. Right. So the stress dominance hypothesis says that at higher elevations, because the environment is harsh, you know, you have limited, uh, you have decreasing resources, the temperatures can be really low, the, the environment is really unpredictable and fluctuating. So because of all these harsh conditions, the environment plays a strong role in determining what species will be found there. So environmental filtering 
should dominate. Whereas at the lower elevations, because the environment is stable and benign and species have adapted to it very well, so the species have actually had time and resources to invest in competitive strategies. So they've actually developed very good competitive strategies and so interspecific competition dominates the communities at lower elevations. So at higher elevation, species have not had the resources or the time to invest in competition. They've just been in this constant battle for survival. Whereas at lower elevations, they have those competitive strategies developed. So in the schematic that we had seen earlier, what stress dominance hypothesis says is that this community will be found at higher elevations and this community will be found at lower elevations. Right. So again, the same thing here on a elevational axis. So if I have the data for different elevations, I have the functional and phylogenetic data. And let's say I come up with some metric which measures divergence, that, you know, whatever, some statistical metric I have which can measure the uh, convergence or divergence within the species in a community, then that metric should give me this pattern. It should decrease with elevation. It should go from high, conver uh, high divergence to high convergence, right? So it should uh, decrease with elevation. And this metric is a metric essentially of which measures something you can like dispersion or standard deviation. It's measuring the spread of values. So if beak size is my functional trait, then that spread of values is decreasing with elevation. I have a very constrained set at higher elevations. And again, if I think of phylogenetic diversity, then it should look something like this. So your high elevation community will have these uh, highlighted clades, which are a small dispersion. The branch lengths are very from a, a selected region of the phylogenetic tree. And a low elevation community, you will have one species from each clade. So your sum of all branch length will be high. So you will have high divergence. So this metric that I have used for quantifying dispersion or convergence is known as mean pairwise distance or MPD. So two kinds of metrics here, MPDF for functional and MPDP for phylogenetic distance. So as the name suggests, it's just mean pairwise distance. So the distance between all pairs of available species. <clears throat> so what I want to show with this diagram is that assume that this is your regional phylogenetic tree. And you can construct a similar tree. So a tree is just a cladogram or a dendrogram, right? It's based on distances between relationships between your constituent species. So you can construct a similar tree for functional trait data also. We we always sort of think of this as representing a phylogenetic tree, but you can have relationships between any uh, numeric uh, quantities. So for instance, if these species are uh, characterized by beak sizes, then depending on the similarity of different beak sizes, you can construct a similar tree. And there are tools available to do this. I will not get into that. And you will see that uh, uh, similar beak sizes are closely related on the phylogenetic tree as well. So in this case, if this is a phylogenetic tree, then the branch lengths are actually your DNA sequences or the number of uh, mutations between species. And if it's a functional tree, then it's just the uh, similarity of beak sizes. And I'm just using beak sizes everywhere, I understand. But just stay with me. So if you have a regional functional or phylogenetic tree, then a high elevation community will have low MPD, whether that MPD is functional or phylogenetic, and a low elevation community will have a high MPD. <clears throat> so in a sense, what I'm expecting or what my hypothesis is, is that my MPD, whether it's functional or phylogenetic, will decrease with elevation. So this was my hypothesis. I had the bird data at different elevations. I assembled their traits. So I had now the functional data at different elevations. And I have the phylogenetic relationships at different elevations. I quantified this MPD metric for all these different 48 elevations. And then I plotted what that MPD looked like with elevation. And if my stress dominance hypothesis is true, then I should get a decreasing pattern of MPD. 
and what I actually got was a decreasing pattern. Sorry, that actually was actually not correct. So what I got was in accordance with my hypothesis. I saw that, sorry, I saw that my MPD, whether I measure it with phylogenetic data or I measure it with functional beta traits, that is my traits related to environment, or I measure it with functional alpha traits, they all give me very similar patterns that my dispersion decreases with elevation or my divergence decreases with elevation, which actually means that the, that the communities at higher elevations exhibit a constrained smaller set of traits or phylogenies and the communities at lower elevations are more spread out, right? So this actually is in accordance with stress dominance hypothesis. I also did the similar thing for each individual trait, right? So here I've used all traits together, but you can do the same thing using each individual trait because then that will tell you whether what you hypothesize about that traits function is actually correct or no. So for these traits that I just talked about, wing, tarsus, body mass, beak, diet, primary substrate, foraging mode, and habitat. And you can immediately see that the pattern actually, or the strength of the pattern, strength of this decline in slope changes with different traits. And if you look at these three beta traits or the environment related traits, you will see that they have a much stronger decline than these ecological traits which means that the environment is playing a much stronger role in these regions, in the commun in shaping the communities of these regions than is competition. And this is important because now you know that because environment is, is playing an important role, these communities automatically become vulnerable to any changes in environment. They are sensitive to environmental changes. And that's the key takeaway from all of this, that if, for instance, competition was dominant, then you know that the, the really biodiverse places in the world, such as the tropical rainforests or the tropical coral reefs, they are shaped by how are they able to sustain such high diversity together because of these um, subtle niche differences, because of these important competitive strategies. But here in Eagle Nest, because as I had mentioned earlier, the environment changes drastically along a very small uh, uh, gradient, small spatial scale. It is not very surprising that these communities are so sensitive to uh, changes in environment. So that's your key takeaway recap. Environmental filtering dominates the assembly of high elevation bird communities or in general, all communities which means that these communities are actually very vulnerable to climate change. So if your temperature fluctuates or increases, for instance, these communities will either shift to higher elevations in search of that lower uh, temperature, or they may actually go locally extinct. Uh, so in this entire project, which sort of appears like a, you know, a complete story in itself. There are several parts that I have uh, not focused too much on, but they were important for this analysis. One was, of course, collating the functional trait data and the phylogenetic data, but equally important was the choice of functional traits. And if you actually are ever involved in a project like this, you will realize that there is there is a plethora of different functional traits that are available to be selected and shortlisted from. And your choice should actually depend on your underlying environmental gradient, right? Because I know that in my region, these abiotic factors are changing. I chose these specific traits. There is, uh, as my subsequent work has shown that there is also immense sensitivity to the choice of underlying metric. I have chosen MPD, but there are many different metrics which are available that can be used for quantifying dispersion. And the choice of metric is equally important. And there are a lot of things to be considered when it comes to the choice of metric, which also I will not go into today. But the overall message from this work is that community assembly processes even though they sound very easy as a concept, when it actually comes to measuring them in the field, it requires immense amount of primary and secondary data collation. And 
more importantly it requires immense amount of uh, collaborations across discipline rohan was just a blessing for my phd for instance and that's mostly it thank you i'm not sure how i did time wise but i will stop here thank you so much for your lovely talk that was very interesting um if any of you want to type in questions then we have some time for questions so just feel free to ask questions before anybody asks anything i just want to say that if you want to just reach out to me later with questions or email that's also absolutely fine so don't uh, don't worry if you are hesitant right now thank you is it okay if some of them um you unmute as well like if they want to ask questions uh unmute as in like if they unmute their mics and ask questions of course yeah i would really like that Okay, I will make I will, it more interactive. I'm a retired gynecologist, and I enjoyed your lecture. I understood. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I'm a bird watcher, okay. and another guest lecturer in the, in the beginning had told about birds at different elevations. And I see. So that two thousand meters has stuck in my head, and what you said, I that slide about the phylogenetics and the functional traits. Yeah. and those three things i wrote down and uh, wow. thank you very much uh, it, thank it, you so much thank you so much that really nice it was, it was very uh, you want else with any other questions and that was very clear uh, hi uh, this is chelsea can you hear me yes i can yeah. uh, thank you mansan your uh, lecture was very interesting uh, i have just one small question um during your phd research while you were looking at the uh, changes because of the environment filter what was the one major change that you saw in a lot of the bird family that was common was it a beak ch size change or the uh, body mass or uh, wing length what was the most common trait that you found that was changing uh, what was the, was common in most of the birds right like, yeah so two things here uh because i did not uh, collect the primary data right the primary data was actually collected by rohan and uh, my my primary focus was on moths i this was a comparative study between moths and birds so uh, my main observations were actually related to moths but because this data was analyzed by me uh during the analysis stage you know you you play with your data and i've been playing with this data for a while now i know exactly what kind of patterns i see and the most dominant pattern here is related to body size and wing loading we have a very sharp decline in body size with elevation and we've published a paper on that which was actually contrary to our expectation and we have a sh very sharp increase in wing loading wing load is your uh, uh wing per unit body mass so your wings actually tend to become larger with elevation and your body size tends to decrease with elevation and those were uh, those have been my two most important observations with this data set but they've come from analysis not really from uh, you know when i was in the field if thank I you so much your question yes 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 thank you so much yeah thank you for your question is anyone else okay someone is asking uh if for you to share your email id sure Should I just write it in the chat? Sure. 
mute if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I'm not expecting this crowd to send me uh, endorsements for products or marketing, <laughs> so it's fine. <laughs> Right, so my email address is there, guys. Just feel free to reach out if you have any questions remaining. Yeah. Or if you want to take time and wander over, you know, the yeah. lecture first and then ask questions again, you can still think about it and take your time and ask. So I have one question. I'm Naveen Kumar. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, how this pattern varies depending on season? Is it, it will be uh, similar or uh, will the phylogenity and uh, functionality changes uh, depending on the seasons? Uh, depending on the season? Yeah. Uh, How this pattern varies. Yeah. So I'm glad you asked because the paper that I'm working on right now is on the seasonal differences in stress that dominance hypothesis. So we actually have the work that I've presented today corresponds only to... Um, the breeding season or the summer season, but we did bird transits during the winter also. So it's it's the same identical study, but the communities are now um, uh, wintering communities, right? And uh, see, within the season, I would still expect the same pattern, you know, because even during the winters, the conditions at higher elevations should be more harsh as compared to lower elevations yeah so i would still expect environmental filtering to uh, increase its effect with elevation but if i compare overall summer across winter for any given elevation then i would expect that for the same elevation winters should have higher environmental filtering than summer yeah so the effect that i expect across the elevational gradient within a season should be the same effect across seasons at the same elevation. I expect winters to be stronger, harsher, and therefore more stressful, and therefore stronger environmental filtering. Uh, does, was that clear? Did that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. Thank you. But and they tend to migrate, it. right? Uh, elevational migration happens, right? Correct. So elevational oh. migration will happen. And which is why the all the species, they will sort of move around, right? And the new structure, the new functional or phylogenetic structure that you now see in winter at a given elevation will actually be very different from what was there in summer, even though it's the exact same elevation. And what I'm saying is that this rearrangement, this shuffling that has happened will happen such that now this new structure is uh, more converged, less dispersed. Okay. Thank you. And hopefully we'll publish that paper soon if uh, the reviewers are kind to us. So actually one more thing, yeah. what are the websites can we access like uh, public can access those paper website. I know like JOT, Current Science, such publications in that we can access the papers so that we can read through it. So, um, but, uh, I, yeah, I mean, you can generally just use Google Scholar okay. to search for papers, scientific publications. So if you just use Google Scholar and type in stress dominance hypothesis community assembly, you'll get loads of papers. Yeah, thank you. And if you want to read these specific papers from this study, uh, you can just add in my name. That should help. Okay. Sure, thank you. Okay, so uh, would, should we wait for five more minutes or, or should we conclude this session? Uh, 
Um, yeah, well, we can wait Up for a bit more, sure. So, so, can we wait for a minute more in case you have any more questions? I think there's been a lot of uh, studies uh, at Eagle Nest, right? Like uh, a lot of ecologists are currently, like you said, environmental uh, filtering has played a dominant role in this case. So like you said, regarding them being more vulnerable to climate change, for instance. Yeah, yeah. so we've seen similar patterns for moths. Oh. Um, well, there are there are quite a few people now working in Eagle Nest, not exactly on uh, community assembly, but various different aspects of community ecology. Um, Umesh, I think, is part of LPPL, but uh, even Anand worked here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's Anirudh Marathe who worked on ants. Ramna is now working on ants, frogs. Uh, hey, uh, previously, I think Alak Nanda as well worked. Correct. Well, Aknanda worked on this exact same data that I'm, I presented today, but a different, uh, she asked a different question. Netra is working on ants. Right. It, uh, like there are a lot of research prospects, basically. In, in yeah. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. And never... Because this place is so biodiverse, there's, yeah. There's too much to do and too few people. Agreed, agreed. I've never been there myself, but I've heard of like a lot of pe uh, people doing their projects there as well. Correct, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I'm soon uh, returning to India and joining as a faculty somewhere or the other. I don't know, but uh, yeah, we are always looking for people to work in this region. Oh, that's lovely. So there don't seem to be any questions anymore. Yeah. So I think we can conclude today's session. Okay. Thank you so much for your lecture. It was very clear and very interesting as well. You're welcome. And always, like I said, a pleasure to hear about like work from Ethan Winston. Thank it's you. Pretty interesting. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you to everyone else for your time as well. And just a reminder, there's also an interactive live session tomorrow with Dr. Rob and Dr. Omesh that 5 p.m. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.